veloz en confianza con él. Me imagino que curioso has sido siempre, como todo ser humano. ¿Cuándo descubriste que la curiosidad y tu asombro por las cosas iba a ser la forma en que ibas a vivir o de lo que ibas a comer? ¿O simplemente fue un accidente? Yo me crié en Venezuela. Mi madre es profesora, ya más de 40 años, siendo profesora de literatura en la Escuela Internacional, primero en Venezuela, después en República Dominicana, después en Nueva York y ahorita está en Italia enseñando. Entonces, me crié en un ambiente saturado en el arte, la literatura y la educación. Fui muy afortunado en ese sentido. O sea, fui expuesto a un mundo de las ideas, del cine, de la poesía. Entonces eso tuvo mucho, mucha, mucha resonancia conmigo. Eh, y creo que también, siendo una persona orientada hacia el existencialismo y las grandes preguntas de lo que significa ser un ser humano pensante, pero también mortal, <risa> pone mucha presión en uno en, bueno, ¿qué voy a hacer con mi vida para que valga la pena? O sea, Nada significa nada cuando tienes la mortalidad por enfrente, o sea, todos nos morimos. ¿Y entonces qué? ¿Qué significa lo que uno hace cada día? ¿Qué, qué tipo de contribución puedo hacer? ¿Cómo puedo inspirar a la gente alrededor mío? ¿Cómo puedo curiosearme y, a, y, a, y aprender lo máximo posible o sea, para, para expandir mi mundo, para expandir mi conciencia? Yo no creo que tuve opción. Yo creo que si no... Ah, si no me... Ah, amigo. Escuché una cosa. Si no... Yo creo que si no hubiera... Vamos a decir... Si no me hubiera entregado a esa curiosidad y a, y a ese asombro y utilizar el asombro como mi radar, como mi compás, o sea, para orientarme a esa estrella norte, yo creo que hubiera sido una persona que, que, que hubiera sufrido de, de la depresión y de la ansiedad. O sea, yo pienso que, que para mí el asombro y la curiosidad es una medicina en contra de, de los problemas de conciencia mental. De verdad que sí. Y, y, y me enamoré de, de las tecnologías audiovisuales simplemente porque para mí son herramientas de la inmortalidad. Cuando algo vale la pena debe ser grabado cuando algo, algo vale la pena no puede ser algo que desaparece para siempre entonces me obsesioné desde los 15 años de grabar todas las conversaciones in, intensas que estaba teniendo con mis amigos compartíamos, conversábamos grabábamos y, y eso no ha no ha parado sí. chingada madre chingada
futbolista, narrador de historias, cineasta y conferencista reconocido a nivel mundial. Jason Silva es anfitrión de la serie Frank Games, nominada al Emmy de National Geographic Channel. Es creador de la serie web Shots of All, video documentales que exploran la creatividad, la innovación, la tecnología, el futurismo, la metafísica, el existencialismo y la condición humana. Creador de la serie web Future of Us para AOL, que explora la tecnología exponencial y el futuro de la humanidad. Conferencista mundial, se ha presentado en TED Global, eventos para Microsoft, IBM, Adobe, Oracle, Electronic Arts, Honeywell, PepsiCo, Intel, Dolby y muchos más en todo el mundo. Con ustedes, Jason Silva en su conferencia The Future of Everything. Tools and technologies. 
since the dawn of humanity. And it has always been the case. Siempre ha sido así. Si tú retrocedes y te vas hace cien mil años, hundred thousand years ago, in the savannas of Africa, when early humans, right, were crawling the terrain, and they, they picked up a stick from the ground, and they used that stick to reach fruit that was on a really high tree. We've been using our sticks, our tools, our rudimentary instruments to extend our reach. They have always been scaffoldings and extensions of our will. They are our exoskeletons, our tools are us. And we've always used our tools, again, to extend our reach and to overcome our boundaries. Siempre hemos utilizado nuestras herramientas para sobreponer nuestras limitaciones. De eso se trata. That is who we are. That is who we've always been. Now today, we're living in the age of radical disruption, right? Disruption is the name of the game. Change is the new status quo. Acceleration itself is accelerating. And it feels like the rug is being pulled from underneath our feet. There's this disorientation and a kind of vertigo in the face of such rapid change. And the question is why, right? La tecnología siempre ha transformado el mundo, siempre ha transformado a la humanidad. From the moment in which we developed a wheel, or when we domesticated fire, or harnessed electricity, all of these technologies slapped us in the face and disrupted humanity, right? But the difference is between then and now is that then those changes used to accrue over a longer period of time. So you grew up, past generations would grow up and die in a world that didn't change that much in their own lifespans, right? Today is different. Today those changes are happening in tiempo real. They're happening at exponential speed, right? You go to college and by the time you graduate, what you study could become obsolete. So a new way of making sense of things is required, a new kind of thinking. But first and foremost, the question remains, what the hell is happening? Technology always built over time, it always changed the world over time, but it didn't matter because it happened over many generations. But now it matters, it matters to us, because it's happening in real time, and we don't want to get left behind. And this has to do with the fact that technology evolves or changes at an exponential rate. But human beings, el ser humano, todavía piensa de forma lineal. So we are wired for linear thinking. We are wired. Our intuition about change is linear. But technology is exponential. You see the problem here? There's a cognitive dissonance built into us that we are biased towards thinking linearly, right? And the world is changing exponentially. As Peter Diamandis, who spoke here a number of years ago, famously said, the brain evolved in a world that was linear and that was local. And now we live in a world that is global and that is exponential. So we need to adjust. We need to move beyond our cognitive biases and our linear blind spots so that we can take advantage of the unique opportunity we live in and the exponential times that we live in. So what's the difference between linear and exponential change? What's a real simple example that shows the difference between linear progress and exponential progress? An example you'll remember at the next cocktail party you go to when you're explaining to your friends or your parents what's happening in the world of innovation and tech. And Ray Kurzweil, who is the head of engineering of Google, who wrote a famous book called The Singularity is Near, When Humans Transcend Biology, and who Bill Gates called the best man alive at predicting the future. He uses an example called the 30 Steps Example to showcase the difference between linear and exponential change. 
You've probably heard this before if you're studying tech and innovation, but just in case you haven't, I want to tell you this example again. So 30 linear steps, one, two, three, four, five, over time gets you to 30, right? That's easy. 30 linear steps gets you to 30. That's how we think about change, right? Because when we had to run away from lions in the savannas of Africa when the rain evolved, we had to make a linear calculation. So that's our wire. But now take the same 30 steps, the same amount of steps, but each one is exponential. So in 30 steps, you actually get to a billion. 30 linear steps get to 30. 30 pasos lineares te lleva a 30. But 30 exponential steps get you to a billion. 30 pasos exponenciales te lleva a mil millones. Same amount of steps. And technology changes exponentially. So thanks to that astounding speed, that's the reason why your smartphone that you carry around in your pocket, that you complain when the Wi-Fi drops, is actually a million times cheaper a million times smaller, yet a thousand times more powerful than what used to be a $60 million supercomputer that was half the size of this building 40 years ago. Swallow that for a moment so that you can appreciate the astounding ingenuity of human beings and the astounding progress of our technology. It used to cost $60 million and was half the size of this building and you needed special privilege and permission to get close to it. And that supercomputer has shrunk down to a device a million times cheaper, a million times smaller, yet a thousand times more powerful. How does this change? Just that one example alone what's possible for human beings. Stephen Johnson in his best-selling book Where Good Ideas Come From, A Natural History of Innovation, introduces this concept of the adjacent possible, right? The perimeters of possibility. And it's a great lens, I think, through which we should be probing what we can do and what we can achieve. Understanding exponential change and then exploring the adjacent possible that emerges when thinking that way. He describes the adjacent possible as a shadow from the future that hovers over the present and provides a map of all the ways in which the present can reinvent itself. How does the adjacent possible for humanity change knowing that a young kid in Mexico with a smartphone in his hand has better communications technology than a president had 25 years ago? For those that complain that these technologies are only for the rich, think again. A young kid, I just came back from El Salvador, where I gave a speech to one of the largest banks, and they told me there that there's more cell phones than people in that country now. A young kid in Mexico or in El Salvador with a data plan on his phone and a SIM card has better communications technology than a head of state had 25 years ago. How does this change what becomes possible? I remember reading an article by Bill Clinton in Time Magazine, it was a cover story. It was called The Case for Optimism. And I remember in the article he cited a United Nations study, I think it was from 2010, and that study concluded that the cell phone was the greatest invention in human history to pull people out of poverty. Think about that for a second. The age of exponential change has brought forth tools and technologies that are among the greatest tools and technologies ever devised by humanity to lift all ships, to address all the grand challenges of humanity, to help everyone potentially, right, live a better life. And if you think of this analogy, the exponential progress of the cell phone, right, the price going down, the size going down, the capacity going up, and all this happening exponentially, you extend that outwards to all information technologies, you start to understand that we are limited only by human imagination, right? We must move beyond the arrogance of the adult, 
who have been there and seen that, so the adult mind that Michael Pollan writes about. We must instead embrace the child's eye view of what is possible, right? The child that explores but doesn't exploit, right? Anything becomes possible on the back of these exponential technologies, but we must dissolve our limited and our limiting beliefs, our patterns of thinking, those representations behind which we are trapped. Think about it. When you're a child, you're exploring your world, and you're creating a map of the territory. And that map provides you with a set of familiar algorithms and behaviors that essentially act as shorthands to function in the world. And by the time you turn 18 or 25, you're like, I know the world, and I know what's possible, and I know my limits, and so on and so forth. And then you give up. You stop exploring the territory. And you start living inside of your own maps your own models of reality, your own models of what's possible, your own limiting beliefs. And the problem then is the kind of amnesia that occurs where you confuse the map for the territory and you think those maps are reality. Meanwhile, reality keeps changing. Technology keeps advancing exponentially and you're still stuck in your maps. So you must pierce through your representations. You must get through your cognitive biases, your linear way of thinking, your false belief that you've seen it all before and that you know what's possible because you don't. And what's possible is actually beyond and even greater than any example I could give today. So I think this is cause for celebration. I think human progress is astounding. I think the capacity, the uncanny ingenuity with which we have been able to overcome every challenge that's ever been in front of us says something about the human spirit, I think, especially when leveraged to address the challenges before us and impact the world in a positive way. And the inspiration that I feel when I come across these ideas, to me at least, is an antidote to the doom and gloom and despair that you see in the media, where if it bleeds, it leads. We are wired for negativity, and we are wired for fear, because we are the descendants of the most nervous humans from the past. But the truth is, things are getting better every day. Steven Pinker, for example, in his viral TED Talk, The Myth of Violence, showed the data of how, at the level of violence, globally, the numbers added up, humanity has never been safer. And the chances of a human dying at the hands of another human are lower than they've ever been in all of human history by far. It doesn't mean there's not pockets of violence in the world. It doesn't mean there's not problems to be addressed. But it's good to know the numbers, to see the progress, to realize that we live in the greatest time of all of human, of all of human history by far. So how to reach, how to reach people with these ideas? How to get these ideas out into the world? Well, We've never had a better time. Social media gives each of us a voice, each of us the opportunity to get the word out, to provide an antidote to the doom and gloom, to spread positivity, to spread wonder, to spread curiosity, to spread awe. That is what it's all about, right? As Peter Diamandis and others have said, we may be flawed, stumbling primates, but when we work together, my friends, we are primates that can fly. That is who we are, right? Everything we want is on the other side of fear. The only way out is through. And so a while back, I started doing these videos on the internet. I called them Shots of Awe, Bastillas de Asombro. And my goal was to, I guess you could say, infect people with positivity, infect people with optimism, right? There's a reason when a video spreads on the internet, we call it a viral video. Because the new replicators now are not DNA molecules, they're ideas, right? And ideas leap from brain to brain, as James Gleick wrote. Ideas have infectivity, right? Ideas have spreading power. And even though ideas are not made of nucleic acid, they have achieved more evolutionary change and at a rate that leaves the old gene panting far behind, right? It's like he wrote this new kingdom that rises above the biosphere, and the denizens of this kingdom are ideas. 
And so I started putting these ideas out into the world through my videos, free of charge, just to try to get people excited. And I owe my whole career to these videos and to social media. And so I'd like to show you one of these videos here to kick things off in an audiovisual way. This video is called, To Be Human Is To Be Transhuman. Ser humano es ser transhumano, transhumanista, transcender nuestras limitaciones. Por favor, el video número uno. Thank you. So there's a great line by Shakespeare in which he says, We know what we are. We know not what we may be. And in the age of accelerating technologies in which we extend the cognitive reach of our minds, the perimeters of our humanness with these extensions of self, these exoskeletons, these technological scaffoldings, you know, the wings of our aircrafts and the signals traveling through our smartphones, sending our thoughts electrified with the speed of light across oceans of sky. We redefine and extend what it means to be human. Edward O. Wilson says, we have actually decommissioned natural selection, and now we must look deep within ourselves and decide what we wish to become. We are now the chief agents of evolution. We have reversed engineered the software of biology and are about to rewire and upgrade and redefine what it is to be a homo sapien. Juan Enriquez uses the term homo evolutus, the being that evolves itself, that transforms itself, right? Ray Kurzweil, we've been staying in the caves, we haven't stayed on the planet. Biology, just another membrane to be transcended. You know, Marvin Minsky used to say, will robots inherit the earth? Yes, they will, but they will be our children. You know, I love this idea because we hear the term transhumanism, and what it means to be human is to be transhuman. We are the species that transforms and transcends. We never stop. We always did. It's what we are. Now, I'm definitely on Team Human, and I have a relentless optimism. And no doubt, as you've heard me speak about exponential technologies, I see progress everywhere. Now, I've had the opportunity, I've had the opportunity to viajar el mundo para compartir estas y estas ideas, dando charlas y conferencias everywhere, desde Chile hasta Colombia, hasta El Salvador, hasta Sudáfrica, Australia, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Londres, San Francisco, you name it. Y lo que me he dado cuenta, después de que trato de explicarles a las personas por qué este progreso es a tanta velocidad, la gente dice, ok, fine, eso es increíble, eso es difícil de creer, pero... Te creo, porque lo he visto. So people, even though it's, it's a lot to take in, people buy into the notion because obviously they've seen it. They've seen the computer, even the, the one that was this size, shrink to the iPhone. They see the iPhone double in capacity every two years. So people, people understand it because they've witnessed it. But what I'm often asked, porque la gente me pregunta es, what about, you know, biology? We're still human mortal beings. And what about infrastructure? Concrete, the world of atoms, certainly those things are not changing exponentially. But no doubt you guys came across an article a few years ago, and if you didn't, you should check it out. It's called Software is Eating the World. And so what's happening now is biology is becoming an information technology, and concrete atoms are becoming an information technology too. So with biology, we call it biotechnology. And with, you know, phys the physical matter and atoms, we call it nanotechnology. So let's start with biotechnology. Biotechnology means mastering the information processes of biology. Turns out, we are made of language. Estamos hechos de lenguaje. Estamos hechos de información. We are made of language and we are alphabetic all the way down. DNA is code. Our genes are little software programs. And our capacity to program and reprogram the software of life is also accelerating at an exponential rate. In fact, gene sequencing, the speed at which we can sequence our genes, is actually progressing three times faster 
than exponential, according to Ray Kurzweil. So it's going even faster than those numbers I've listed before. One of the world's most eminent physicists, Freeman Dyson, he wrote an article about a new age of wonder in biology. He envisions a very near future where a new generation of artists and engineers will be writing genomes with the way, that, the way Shakespeare and Byron wrote verses. Think about that. The genome is now the new canvas, the new alphabet for human creativity and human enterprise. What are we going to make when we become the species that starts to speciate itself and self-evolve itself by manipulating its own genome? Well, first and foremost, we're going to see a revolution in healthcare. The age of personalized medicine is here, right? The digitization and synthetic biology will allow us to take your stem cells and grow you a replacement organ if you need it, to download software patches for biology, to program your genes away from diseases, away from aging, right? It's gonna change the game. Bill Gates has this dream of engineering a mosquito that inoculates you against malaria instead of giving you malaria. And all the kids that die from simple illnesses and don't have access to basic medical care, all of a sudden that problem is solved. The next trillion dollar investment space for emprendedores is going to be the age of biology, the age of personalized medicine, the age of a revolution in healthcare. Miniature sensors in our bodies measuring our vitals at all times, quantify self revolution, feeding that information back into the cloud finding patterns in the data, addressable, actionable things that we can do to keep ourselves healthier. The XPRIZE Foundation had a $10 million prize for the first team around the world that could design a laboratory and a smartphone. They call it a medical tricorder, and it's lab on a chip technologies, right, that you can deploy in a rural village, right, and it can diagnose you better than 10 doctors in a hospital. When you have a clinic in a phone, how does that change the game? And you distribute that in poor villages in India or Mexico. Think about that. We're going to change, not just how we address illness, it will be finally the end of cancer and all these other afflictions that rob us of those we love. I can't wait until we engineer superhuman capacities and health spans and radically extend our lifespan. And it's going to be controversial. Google co-founder Larry Page, he co-founded Calico, California Life Extension Company, a software company for biology. This is the Google guy. They get it in Silicon Valley. They know the human lifespan is going to be radically expanded. I mean, we've already done it with basic antibiotics and vaccinations. I mean, people used to die at 30, right, for preventable stuff. Today, the lifespan pushes 80 or more. When we can modify our genes for longevity, think about it. How nice would it be to have another hundred years of health to explore the universe? You know, when Google co-founded, when Larry Page co-founded Calico, they had a cover story in Time Magazine. It's called Google and the End of Death. Yeah? This is not a joke. Because the idea, of course, is like, what does it mean to be human when we don't have to die? By, by withering away and witnessing our own decay. That existential conundrum perhaps will finally be solved. We will engineer our own godhood. No joke. So that's biotechnology. Then there's nanotechnology. So the seminal book on nanotechnology is called Engines of Creation. It was called, written by Eric Drexler. Los motores de la creación. Es el libro más importante escrito sobre la nanotecnología. And the basic analogy that was used to explain nanotech to me is with nanotechnology, you're programming atoms the way that you program ones and zeros in digital technology. So look at everything that we can do by moving ones and zeros around with digital tech. And now imagine that, but programming atoms with nanotech. That means buildings that self-assemble. <laughs> that means software that can write its own hardware in the world. That means moving to a world beyond scarcity, as Peter Diamandis and Stephen Kotler wrote in their New York Times bestseller, Abundance, why the future will be better than you think. 
They explain it very simply. They say basically that technology is a resource liberating mechanism and that scarcity is contextual. So new technologies can make things that are scarce abundant. And certainly biotechnology, sorry, nanotechnology can do that. And another way of understanding what nanotech is, is look to nature. When I plant a seed from a tree, I plant the seed in the earth. That's so let's talk about the future of us. What does that even mean? The future of us. It's a look at what comes next. It's a look at what might be. Because today, exponentially emerging technologies are transforming what's possible. They're helping us overcome, transcend, even biological limitations. The very rules of what it is to be human are up for grabs. We're rewriting the software of life with biotechnology. We're turning matter into a programmable medium with nanotechnology. We're creating sentient minds with artificial intelligence that are bound by the limitations of biology. These three overlapping revolutions, TNR, genetic nanotechnology, and robotics, together will be leveraged to lead us towards a black hole like impossible to fathom singularity. It's like staring into the sun. A moment of a rousing symphonic climax when all of my blood pressure network together transcends its biological origins and we become something more. People worry about the AIs and the gadgets. Well, as Kurzweil says, that's going to be us. The future of us is ours to dream of. Now, as you can tell, I'm very excited, but my, yeah. okay. but my excitement means nothing if you aren't excited. You are the generation that's going to create that world of wonders that awaits us through looking glass and down the rabbit hole. Ustedes son los emprendedores, los que van a crear esta utopia beyond our imaginations. So I need you guys to feel that inspiration. I need your mental frameworks to be upended in quaking, annihilating glory, as Terrence McKenna said. I need you guys to have your world turned inside out and upside down. I need you guys to keep exploring and not exploiting. I need you guys to probe the perimeters of possibility. You know, one of the most exciting emerging areas of development, which I think your creativity is vital for, is the Internet of Things. El Internet de las Cosas. So what's the Internet of Things? Well, as uh, Kevin Kelly, who started Wired Magazine, said, just the same way that we harnessed electricity and then we electrified the planet, now we are putting intelligent sensors, you know, miniature sensors that are advancing exponentially with AI in them, into everyday things all over the world. We're draping the planet with AI sensors. So you can think of this as like neurons that we're putting in everything and linking those neurons together. So in the words of Kevin Kelly, we are cognitizing the planet. We're infusing the planet with AI. So connectivity in the internet goes beyond the computer screen, beyond the phone, into everything. When everything is connected to everything else, as Eric Davis wrote, matter becomes mind. Because everything has AI in it, everything will have intelligence in it, everything will gather data, everything will give us feedback, everything will revolve around us and respond to our needs and preferences. And so the opportunity to create algorithms and goods and services that radically optimize our lives and creativity, that offload the things we don't want to deal with to virtual assistants, that create a sense that the world is an extension of our agency and will. One of the seminal books on the Internet of Things was called The Age of Enchanted Objects, because that's essentially what's happening. Similar to how indigenous cultures in the past perceived the world with a kind of animism. Everything had agency, and the gods made it rain, and you had to talk to the trees to give you fruit. 
this animism, we're engineering it into the Internet of Things. We're literalizing our animistic dreams of a world that is alive and can communicate with us. So, the future of entertainment, the future of wellness, the future of productivity, the future of imagination and entrepreneurship on the back of a world where all of us will be augmented and amplified by smart everything. Smart cars, smart things, smart television, smart lighting, smart everything. It'll all be like we're the president and we're walking around with 15 assistants optimizing our lives. But for everybody. So this next video looks at that. And I, we, I did it with a company called Western Digital. And it was about how big data could create a world where the internet of things is really the intelligence of things. What well, if I want to be this? We've all heard the increasingly used trendy term, the Internet of Things, and how game changing it's going to be as we extend sense of miniature sensors into everyday objects. Everyday objects will start to give us real time feedback, and the world essentially will come alive. This is the Internet of Things. What if we evolve the term a little further? What if instead of the Internet of Things, we enter the realm? Intelligence of things. The intelligence of things is where the internet of things meets artificial intelligence. In the future of artificial intelligence, it's senseless unless we extend it into the world of everyday objects. This idea that as we impregnate intelligence into the world of physical things that we inhabit, the world essentially will come alive. This real time feedback, this interface that we become enlivened with intelligence. Will essentially create, will birth a world that will increasingly talk back to us. How this will change human subjectivity, how this will change the human condition, the space of mind in which we dwell, is in the following way. Increasingly, it will dovetail our minds to the world, right? And as the world starts talking back, the distinction between self and world will start to disappear. The external space, the external world will increasingly start to feel like an extension of our mind, like an extension of our agency, which will bleed over into a world of predictability, a world that will know what we want before we want, a world of serendipity, a world in which you look for something, you find something else, and you realize that what you found is more conducive to your needs than what you thought you were looking for. We're talking about a world optimized for human creativity and human enterprise. A world that is responsive. A world that is alive. A world that is intelligent. As I imagine, so it becomes. And this is the very essence of magic. Now, you're pumping all this data, you're pumping all this AI into sensors, into the world of everyday objects, and again, you birth a world, the intelligence of things. The mind will have fully turned itself inside out. We will be inhabiting the condensation of human imagination. The nodes in our brain, the neurons will have spilled out into the world. We will cloak the planet of mind and data. This, my friends, is a singularity of mind and meaning. When everything becomes linked with everything else, matter becomes mind. This is the intelligence of things. So as you can see, possibilities are endless. And I have a few minutes left before my time is up, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about social impact. Because as amazing as the possibilities are, las infinitas posibilidades de progreso que tenemos, si no lo utilizamos para extender la empatía, y para impactar positivamente a los demás y lo que más lo que los que más lo necesitan entonces it's for nothing so we need to use these tools and technologies to address the grand challenges of humanity and to help those that need it most so a while back the folks at Singularity University and other institutions that think about exponential change proposed this notion in the age of exponentials everybody wants to be the next Mark Zuckerberg Everybody's trying to figure out how they can become a billionaire, you know, come up with a quick idea, program it with an algorithm, boom, go viral, and you're rich. But what if we, what if we redefine the term billionaire in the age of exponential technologies? What if we reframe what it means to be a billionaire, right? What if in the age of exponential technologies, a 
billionaire is somebody who positively touches a billion lives. Because that's what's possible. That's what you guys can do. And what a beautiful, yes, exactly. What a beautiful, what a beautiful matrix, what a beautiful way of measuring success. You know, today, the epidemic of anxiety and of depression has reached global scale. More people are committing suicide than are dying from natural disasters and armed conflict combined. So people are hungry for meaning and purpose and signification. And the pathologies of mental distress, I think, are proof that people need something to believe in, to believe that life is inherently meaningful, not meaningless, that progress is real and possible. And again, we may be flawed some the primates, but that when we work together, we are primates that can fly. We are the captains of Spaceship Earth, and we are all, right, the captains, the crew. We must work together. I'd also like to mention the importance, I think, of remaining open, the power of awe and wonder. El poder cognitivo y los beneficios cognitivos de asombro. Yo llamo mis videos pastillas de asombro, shots of awe, y la razón es que hay, there's research coming out now at universities like Berkeley and Stanford that have studied how blowing our minds, essentially, how experiences that smash the models of reality that we have built up are cognitively beneficial. So they describe el asombro as an experience of such perceptual expansion, una experiencia de suficiente expansión mental, that these mental models of the world are dissolved to make room for the new experience. Maybe the first time you saw your child being born, or when you fell in love for the first time, or when you learned how an iPhone works, you know? And these experiences of awe, they leave an afterglow of increased well-being, increased creativity, and, and, and have cognitive anti-inflammatory effects as well. And of course, an increased empathy. So what you have then is a realization that exposure to ideas that are outside your comfort zone, exposure to ideas that are beyond your representation, exposure to ideas that challenge you to think outside the box, to fall down the rabbit hole, to step through the looking glass, are actually cognitively beneficial. It's good for your creativity. It's good for your curiosity. It's good for you to follow your bliss. And so that's the inspiration for my videos. And so I want to leave you with one more video. It's called The Captains of Spaceship Earth. And the video, again, is about our capacity to positively touch a billion lives, to blow our own minds with inspiration, and to believe in the words of Barack Obama, yes, we can. So please show it. Rosa, will be there. Go ahead. We live in a world of exponential technological advancements. What this literally means that we have new construction kits for our reality, new tools with which to probe at the adjacent possible. So consider the implications, right? As Marshall McLuhan used to say, first we build the tools, and then the tools build us. We are designed by what we have designed. There are these feedback loops of mind, tool, and world that radically redefine our boundaries, that radically transform what it means to be human. To be human today is to crisscross the skies. To be human today is to create technosocial wormholes, not to my So what do we do? Well, we need to radically reach out to one another in ways that we haven't before. There's a great line that says that empathy rarely extends beyond our line of sight. In other words, it's out of sight, it is out of mind. But if anything, these wireless communication technologies are radically extending beyond our line of sight, they will find the morphological maps of the real, giving us the astronaut overview view effect. We are seeing the big picture, we are seeing the captains of spaceship Earth. And what shall we do? We need to extend our hands to one another. We need to have such tools to overcome all the limitations of our humanity. We have the power, we have the will, we have the capacity, the creative capacity to overcome our limits. So today, millions of us link to one another, creating a global world, a global brand. What is the new definition of billionaire? The new definition of billionaire is he who will positively affect the lives of a billion people. She will reach out and say, I will positively affect the lives of a billion people. This should be our goal. This is our responsibility.
is a chance. So there you go, guys. That would be thank you. social webs. I'm Jason L. Silva on Instagram, Jason Silva on Twitter. I hope to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Gracias. Gracias.